Today, I'm gonna take an eight liter big block, strap on a huge pair of twin turbos, an intercooler, fuel injectors, computer, strap it down to the dyno, and turn up the boost until it either pukes parts or makes an honest 1,000 horsepower. And it turns out, I get a lot more than I bargained for. So my wife got the new Tesla Model S Plaid, 0 to 60 in under 2 seconds. Now, I've been in some fast cars, but the Plaid is in a league all of its own for street cars with over a thousand horsepower. It's brutal. Oh my god. Which is all well and good, it's an amazing car, but I guess I'm kind of old school in at least one way. You see, I don't care if my wife is more successful than I am or if she makes more money than I do or any of that, but to have a car that's more powerful than mine, clearly this could not stand. But what would it take to be more powerful than the Plaid? Well, you could have somebody build you a twin turbo Lamborghini Huracan. There's a small matter of a couple hundred thousand dollars. Now, granted, Plaids aren't cheap either, but the reality is I'd like to kind of do this on a budget since it's primarily for ego and bragging rights. Perhaps then, I need to answer a much more fundamental question. Could I even make that much power? Now, the Plaid puts out a stated 1,000 plus horsepower. That's a tall order for any piston engine that fits in a car, even these days. But how would I go about doing it? Now, this is Dave's garage, but I don't typically feature a lot of automotive content. And yet, I decided to build a big block, 8 liter, twin turbocharged, intercooled, and injected engine. I guess it's okay in one sense because at least its fuel system is all controlled by a RISC microcontroller. As we go, I'll tell you how it all works as a system, like what a wastegate is and why blow-off valves sound so cool, everything else you need to know. Most people are familiar with the classic roller dyno, but how can we test an engine to verify that it's making a given amount of power before it's even installed in a car yet? Ah, well that's where the engine dynamometer comes in. And I was blessed with a close friend that just happened to have a 1500 horsepower dyno cell right in his shop by my house. That friend was Jim Preston, and I say was because he just passed away a few weeks ago at the age of 70. It wasn't actually one of the reasons I started this video, but Jim was so integral to this project that I've got to take a moment or two to tell you about him. Now, he smoked three packs a day, but it was skin cancer that ultimately got him. He was the oldest Sammamish native that I've ever met, and given the amount of rain and cloud here in the Seattle area, I imagine that the most sun he ever likely got was probably in Cambodia or Vietnam. Back then, Jim was 19 and he had just been accepted to the local technical college for the heavy duty diesel mechanics program when his Vietnam draft number was called. It was nine months into his tour when he got a bittersweet letter from his mom explaining that he had actually been exempt from the draft as a student, but they hadn't realized it at the time. After I met him about 10 years ago, Jim became my mechanical graduate professor. Now, I thought I knew a great deal about cars and mechanics when I met him, but I learned so much from him over the course of the next decade that the only way it would be possible is if I started out completely ignorant, so perhaps I did. Two to three times a week I'd wander into his shop up the road to check on him and get updated on the various cars and projects out in the shop. Jim owned the shop and did most of the race cars and projects, while the engines were built by a retired NASCAR engine builder named Rick, and then often tuned by a General Motors performance specialist named Larry Webb. Larry looks like it has the swagger of an old Paul Newman, but he's really there because he spent about 40 years at General Motors working on carbs and fuel injection, and for all I know, he may have literally worked on the design of the Rochester Quadrant carburetor that my motor originally came equipped with back then, and Jim just happens to know him. Pretty handy for me. It'd be something like having Eric Clapton stop by to tune your guitar. When he couldn't find a factory metering rod of the exact dimensions that he felt were needed, he turned his own on Jim's lathe right then and there. Each week was like an episode of CSI, except the victim was a dead Hemi or Mustang or Corvette. Jim was something of a legend, so people had often exhausted several other mechanics with their problem before they'd be referred to him at last. Quite often, he knew what the fix was before the car arrived, just based on the description. At some point, there are only so many ways an old car can go wrong, and sometimes I wonder if he'd seen them all by now. For new problems, Jim diagnosed and debugged logically, like the great developers I've known. He didn't just swap parts on to try it to see if it helped unless he knew specifically why and what he was doing. Like last fall, he had been troubleshooting an old pickup that would fire up but then die immediately after starting with a big belch of fire back out the intake and carb. 
He did some troubleshooting to rule out the obvious, but ultimately closed up shop for the day without a solution. He awoke in the middle of the night with a start because he suddenly knew what the answer was. The muffler had rusted which had caused the metal to expand internally and had therefore become choked off. It was good enough for cranking the engine over, but once combustion actually started, the sudden back pressure would overwhelm the intake charge, overpower the piston, reverse the engine's rotation briefly, and hence the backfire and the stall. Secure in the knowledge of what it was, he fell back asleep and slept solid till morning when he confirmed that his theory was in fact correct. His shop was incredibly tidy and organized, if not clean enough for dining. There were no junk drawers, no piles of nonsense parts kept just in case. He taught me the value of space and organization. Doesn't mean I always follow it, but now I appreciate it. My favorite day was Fridays when the local septuagenarians would wander in to commiserate about their olden days, tell tales from their youth that were sometimes rooted in reality, and compare notes on the inevitable decline and fall of Western civilization. They also talked a lot about how hard it was to get any parts these days without ordering it online since they all feared and loathed computers even though they all used them daily anyway. Hanging out at Jim's shop always reminded me of the barber shop scene in the movie Gran Turismo. Now, Jim was a lot more cheerful than Eastwood, but the vibe was kind of the same. The Playboy magazines went back decades in neat rows with various favorites decorating the cabinet doors. He smoked like a chimney, cursed like a sailor, and it took a special kind of girlfriend or wife like my own who would venture in there with you. This was no simple fix-it shop though. Jim was a skilled fabricator and machinist. The shop was equipped with powerful lathes, large four-axis mills, which he always hand-programmed, and as noted, his complete engine dynamometer cell. So what exactly is a dyno? Well, put simply, it's a machine you hook your engine up to that measures how much torque your engine can make at any given RPM. Because horsepower is in turn a mathematical function of torque and RPM, it provides a continual readout of instantaneous horsepower as well. It all works by mounting your engine up to a large, specialized pump, known as a water brake, capable in Jim's case of holding back 1500 horsepower worth of pumping through a controlled restriction. There's an enormous 5000 gallon tank on the roof that cools and recirculates the water. The dyno varies that restriction and by so doing it can vary the load on the engine in real time, which allows it to increase or decrease the engine speed at will. Generally, the operator applies maximum throttle and then the restriction varies on the dyno so that the engine is gradually sweeps up through the RPM band and measurements are taken every 100 RPM or so. When it gets to red line, the throttle is then released and the engine returns to idle and you've got all your data. As I said, the restriction is actually called a water break, and it's a clever device originally invented for the British Admiralty to test large naval engines. It looks something like a torque converter and uses some similar principles. Suffice to say, it's a great way to place a precisely controlled load on an engine and hold it at a particular speed. But how does it actually measure the torque? Well, that's incredibly simple. When the engine is running and straining against its mounts making power, one of the mounts contains a scale that the engine pulls on. Now, thanks to Newton, for any force the engine makes in rotating in one direction, a counterforce will be applied to the mount in the other direction as well. And if that mount contains a scale and happens to be one foot from the center line of the crank, then it simply has to measure the force in pounds and it magically yields the precise measurement of torque being produced in pound feet. Since horsepower is literally torque times RPM divided by 5252, you have all three numbers at any given point. It really is that simple. They just run the engine at max effort and then read the scale to see how much it's pulling on its mounts at any point in time. To get started, I began reading books on turbocharging and system design. The best one I could find was a book called Maximum Boost by a fellow named Corky Bell and I'll put a link to it in the video description. It contained all the theory and some of the practice that I'd need to transform my spare ZZ502 engine into a serious power plant. This ZZ502 had been in my 1969 Camaro RSSS. I'd had an amazing fabricator named Tim Hogan build me a sheet metal intake to fit it all under the low factory hood and I installed and programmed a BS3 fuel injection controller to run it all. It was a lot of fun to look at, but kind of a handful to drive. It was supposed to be a streetcar, but it just didn't have the manners for it. At some point, I decided to overhaul the setup and I replaced the powertrain with that of a modern LS3 Camaro. At 435 horsepower, it was more than enough motor and much easier to drive and manage. In fact, it drove like a late model Camaro but rode and looked like the classic it was. Then eventually I sold it to make room for another project and that left me with just the ZZ502 itself off in the corner of my shop. And so that motor would serve as the basis for my build. But the ZZ502 is rated at, you guessed it, 502 horsepower. It wasn't going to be as simple as boring and stroking it because I'd need to make it over 1000 cubic inches or at least twice as large to even have a hope. Plus, I wanted a little power margin over the plaid, so even double the size wouldn't quite do, had that even been possible. But the biggest you can practically go is 632, and even that requires a different block and exotic parts and machining. The displacement of an engine is important in that it's a measurement of how much air and fuel can be ingested during each combustion cycle. 
A typical performance engine makes about 1 horsepower per cubic inch of displacement. But if you can't build a 1000 cubic inch engine, what if you could somehow stuff 1000 cubic inches of air and fuel into the 500 cubic inch engine? Of course, you'd have to pressurize the whole thing up to two atmospheres to do it, but in theory, that should work. And that's all that supercharging is, ramming more air into the motor than it would take in on its own at normal air pressure. You do it by strapping a big air pump to the motor so that every time it takes in its air and fuel, it takes in literally twice as much as it otherwise would. Or if you went to the pressure of three atmospheres, it'd be like having a 1500 cubic inch engine, give or take various losses and inefficiencies. There are two primary ways of doing it. The first is conventional supercharging, which is to use a mechanical air pump. There are positive displacement and centrifugal pumps, but they share the same goal, fill the motor at some higher air pressure. They are usually driven by a belt off the crankshaft. A number of factory cars have come equipped with smaller units and you might also be familiar with the giant ones atop nitro burning top fuel cars. There's also turbocharging, which is to use the hot exhaust coming out of the engine to spin a turbine. That turbine is connected to a compressor wheel, and that compressor wheel then pumps fresh air in to generate the boost pressure. It's considered free horsepower in many ways because unlike a belt driven supercharger, there are no parasitic losses because it's making use of waste heat energy from the motor to do its work. I decided that I wanted to shoot for about 20 psi of boost, around 2.5 atmospheres. This in theory would be enough boost to generate 2.5 times the naturally aspirated output of the engine which as I said was 500 horsepower. So that would put me at a target of 1250 horsepower, at least on paper. But unfortunately it's never quite so simple. Compressing air in this manner also creates a lot of heat, and hot air is less dense at any given pressure so we need to chill the air back down before it goes into the engine. To that end I would use what's known as an intercooler. The goal is to pass the now hot compressed air through it and take some of the heat back out of it so that it's closer to the ambient temperature. There are two types, air to water and air to air. The latter uses cool air passing through the car's grill to chill the unit through which the hot air is routed and that heat exchanger then sheds heat to the atmosphere. Except that wouldn't really be an option for me because although I've seen it attempted with big fans, it's hard to replicate the effect of driving 60 miles an hour when you're actually sitting still in the dyno room. The other kind is air to water where the heat exchanger is chilled by a liquid. As you can imagine, it's an ideal situation for something like a boat motor where there's an infinite supply of cool water, but it also works in a car if you then have a separate circuit to chill the fluid back down. In my case, I simply connect the intercooler to the tap water supply and I'd have an inexhaustible supply of fresh cold intake air. I would need a very large intercooler for this much engine and this much boost, so I got one spec for 1500 horsepower. It's a nicely fabricated unit and I found it new on eBay for only 120 bucks, which is amazing. The turbos themselves would come next. Now, I could make an entire video on turbo selection, but I narrowed my choices down to the GT45, T4 or T66. Specifically, I went with the 3.5 inch with a 92 trim wheel. If you want to chat about the specifics of how and why, hit me up in the video comments or on the subscriber discord server. A turbocharger is essentially an air pump powered by a turbine. The exhaust that comes out of an engine under load is incredibly hot and full of energy. Those exhaust gases come roaring out of the engine at incredible speed and pressure and they are routed through the turbine wheel which then spins up to 50,000 rpm or even more in some cases. That turbine's drive shaft is directly connected to an air pump on the cool intake side of the engine. That air pump forces air into the engine at high pressure. The exhaust and intake side never mix and are completely separate, only the drive shaft connects the two sides. A turbocharger then is just a supercharger that uses a turbine stuck into the exhaust flow to power itself rather than a belt off of the crankshaft. As you may have guessed, the more exhaust gas pressure, the more air that gets pumped in on the intake side. The building of this positive feedback loop is what accounts for turbo lag. At rest, there is very little exhaust flow to power the turbo so it's not pumping much if at all. Once you roll into the throttle and start making exhaust however, then the turbine spins up, drives the pump and it makes boost. But that delay can often be felt in the response of a turbocharged engine. While the problem is not enough boost at low load, when operating at high RPM and full load there's so much exhaust that the turbos produce far more boost than the engine can even use. To that end, each turbo is equipped with what's known as a wastegate. When the boost reaches the desired level, it opens up which allows the hot exhaust to bypass the turbo and hence cause it not to make any further boost. Now imagine you've got the engine at full sail and the turbos are just howling away at max boost and then suddenly you close the throttle. The turbos can't just stop instantly so where can all the air go? Without some kind of relief system it's going to blow the intake pipes right off so a blow off valve is used. When the engine goes into vacuum as it would when the throttle is closed, the valve opens to vent excess boost to the atmosphere. And that is the loud blowdown sound that you often hear from the turbos when the driver quickly closes the throttle during boost. 
The whole engine is controlled by a tune that I coded up for a BS3 fuel injection controller. It's a dedicated risk-based system with some very nice hardware for driving both high and low impedance injectors. While I did use a 3 bar map sensor so that the computer is aware of boost and the actual air mass, I did not alter the timing map significantly. I simply brought max advance down to 30 from 35. When there's too much heat and pressure during the compression stroke, the fuel and air charge can ignite spontaneously before the spark plug is fired. Not only is it a sudden pre-ignition and not a nice controlled burn, but the piston is in the wrong place entirely in its rotation, so it can be very destructive to the engine. To avoid it, I took two primary steps, cold tap water through the intercooler which would help keep the air intake temperatures down, and race gas concentrate which would raise the octane of the fuel. The octane number on gasoline is a measurement of just how effectively it can stave off this unwanted ignition. I've got to stress here that I mean real race gas concentrate and not an octane booster. Octane boosters don't work. When they say it'll raise your octane by 7 points, they mean on the right hand side of the decimal point, so from like 91 to 91.7. Hardly useful. Plus, they generally claim to do it by removing harmful deposits and so on that increase your compression ratio, which probably don't exist in a new engine anyway, so I won't get into it any further, just avoid them. Not useful to me when I wanted to bring the octane up to about 100. To do so, I used the measured amount of race gas concentrate and never experienced any detonation. I was quite impressed by it, as our only other high octane option here is the local track which is almost an hour away. At the time anyway, you can get it on Amazon and if you still can, I'll put a link to it in the video description. With that, it was time to hit the dyno. We bolted it into the mounts, connected the fuel and power, fired it off and after warming it up and letting everything stabilize, we ran the dyno pull. How did it do? Well, it made a solid 1200 horsepower and almost identical torque. The dyno pull starts at around 2500 RPM and the engine was already making 1000 foot pounds at that point and it never looked back. And here's where the excuses start a bit. It would have made an easy 1500 but we ran out of fuel pressure. I was using a boost reference fuel pressure regulator which means for every extra psi of air pressure it adds 1 psi of fuel pressure to compensate. But added together to the base fuel pressure that can mean over 80 psi of fuel pressure. And worse, it's got to flow that at a rather massive supply of that fuel at that pressure, and the pump we were using on the dyno just couldn't keep up. As the motor then started to lean out, we had to abandon each pull earlier in the RPM band than we would have liked. But just between you and me, the most it actually made in testing was 1270. Still not bad. My total expenditure on turbo parts was 1440. The pair of turbos was the biggest piece at $495. The nice stainless intake pipe set that I bought was 215 and the stainless turbo headers, which were not a good fit but which worked well enough for the dyno, were 199 I'll put the entire price list in the video description for your review. You'll also see what parts you'll need to make a turbo engine, if you decide to do that. As I said up front, this episode is a little outside my normal lane for my channel, but if you did find it some combination of entertaining and informative, please give it a thumbs up to let me know. And if you're not subscribed to my channel yet, I'd be honored if you'd consider doing so. Do it, Glenn! Do it! Do it! If you have any interest in matters related to autism, ASD, or Asperger's, please check out my book, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. You can read the sample chapter, Burgers with Bill Gates, right now on Amazon and the ebook's on sale for under 10 bucks, so check it out. Thanks for joining me here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I'll see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.